sit. This is Una, and this is Una's roadmap to success. She is a very high energy dog, and uh, she right now is not getting a lot of exercise because she had a, a bad incident. Now she's become dog reactive, and uh, she actually uh, uh, really almost pulled the guardian down when she was out walking. So she really doesn't get walked very much because the guardians are concerned. Now we're hopefully going to uh, get her enrolled in our in our loose leash walking class, and that'll take care of that problem. Uh, but there's a lot of other things that are cascading into that, and that's what we're going to talk about in this video. So the first thing we're going to talk about is exercise, because she is clearly an under-exercised dog. So uh, what I want to do, uh, the, some of the things that we talked about is a doggy stairmaster. So go to the top of the stairs, show you have a treat, throw that to the first landing, and once she goes down there, move a step over. You probably could start on this side of the stairs. And then basically when she's there, then drop one and so it goes all the way to the bottom of the stairs. And when she gets to the very bottom of the stairs, you're going to use your watch word or the word that the family heroes come up with is Texas, means to go down the stairs. Then we're going to call her back to the top of the stairs and we're going to give her another treat and we're going to call this one Michigan. Sit. Now, you saw right there, I gave, she gave me a pro offer to behavior. I gave her a treat or a payment and I said the command word after the treat went into her mouth. Anytime you're going to reward your dog, whether it's this or any other command, treat first, petting or, uh, well, uh, if I, well, if I'm using a treat, treat, and then I'm going to say the command word. And remember, dogs listen to the first word that we say the most. So if I say good sit, the word that's important, she's in the least important position. Now, if I want her to sit, I don't have a treat, so I say sit, sit. So I'm, I'm marrying the, the reward with the command word. And essentially what we're doing is we're, we're paying her for a job. That job was sitting. And she got a little payment for it. The payment is the attention or the treat or the, uh, the petting. All right. So basically, um, uh, for the first time, I would like you to do it with an empty stomach. And keep on throwing those treats up and down the stairs until she's like, you're crazy. I went down there 74 times. Now we know what her maximum number is. We want to exercise her about 50 to 75% of that maximum number multiple times a day. So... Um, one of the things I recommend the Guardian is to start as an exercise journal. So write down the day at the top of a fresh piece of paper, write down the time and how many up-downs on the stairs. Um, we also can play fetch. Now, she only plays fetch for two or three times. I would recommend the Guardian start using a treat reward for that as well. So when you throw the ball, say fetch. When she picks it up with her mouth, say fetch. Then hold the treat out when she comes over, put the treat in her mouth, and then say the word fetch um, after she drops the ball. And then before I pick it up, I would say sit, then I would pick up the ball. If she gets up, tell her to sit again. Sit, fetch. And so the idea is we're going to create a little bit more of an incentive by using the treats because that's a great way to exercise her. Now, you can also throw the treats up and down the stairs outside, but outside you're going to have all these distractions and with the snow and stuff with the winter, you're probably not going to have as much success. Um, five minutes of throwing the treats up and down the stairs is equivalent to like a half an hour walk. But you can do it inside when it's an ice storm or in your PJs or whatever it is you're watching a movie. Commercial break, go over and spend five minutes. And I want the guardians to interpret her being overexcited or barky or any of these unbalanced behaviors as her way of saying, I have too much energy right now, I need some exercise. And so if you think about it that way, you don't get annoyed when she's barking, you take interpret that, oh, she's saying I need more exercise, either I can bark it out or you can exercise me. I don't want to listen to marketing for 10 minutes, so why don't I come over and exercise you on the stairs? Now, the exercise journal will help you identify how often and how uh, many repetitions each time. So you write down the time and how much she fetched, or the number of up and downs on the stairs, or whatever the exercise was. And then if she has a barking incident, write down the time and when that happened. And write a little bit of, it doesn't have to be a paragraph, but, you know, jog, person jogging, you know, somebody out on the trail, or whatever the case may be. So you want to just have a little bit of detail so you can look back later. You'll think you'll remember at the time, but with a lot of data, you won't. Um, so we're going to write down all of her exercise, all of her bad behaviors, the times that she did those, and what was going on at the time. We're also going to put down what time we fed her and anything else that's noteworthy dog related. Then at the end of the day, we're going to give her a letter grade, A through F. If it's anything other than an A, the next day, play around with the elements. Let's say we did three uh, up-downs on the stairs 30 times each. Well, maybe she got a D-minus grade. Okay, the next day, maybe we're going to do five, or we're going to do 40 each. And you keep on playing around with those elements until you start noticing her behavior is overall better. And, you're, and at first, you're going to have all those negative interactions. After a while, you should see less and less of those because we're setting up for success. Now, also, dogs have a big energy zone in the morning and the evening. Uh, find out what time those are, write those down, and then start exercising them before that happens. Remember to do this with an empty stomach. We don't want to cr uh, create any problems with bloat or anything like that. 
So, all right, so for the, uh, the doggy Stairmaster is one. Uh, the laser is something I recommend with some dogs. Now, some dogs should not chase a laser. They get frustrated and anxious and start whining and crying and barking. If that's the case, you should not be doing the laser with your dog. She is about as high up on that ladder of intensity that I would go with and still recommend the laser. Because she's getting so little exercise, go ahead and let her out. Uh, but because she's getting so little exercise, I'll err on doing the laser. But I'd probably res uh, reserve that. There's really so much you get out of it as well. And so you can be standing right here or wherever the window is and have her running laps in the backyard chasing a little red dot. Now, uh, when, I am, when you do it, make sure it's a very gradual, don't have a herky-jerky movement and kind of lead it around and try to keep it about a, a, a foot to three feet in front of her. So it gives her the incentive to chase after it. Um, after a while, you'll get, she'll get to, she should get to the point where she just lays down or stops chasing it, then you know you've burned off that top of energy. Now we can also use uh, treat dispensing toys. Um, so uh, they make a Kong. Uh, oh, one of the things I definitely want the Guardians to do is get an Omega Treat Ball. I think it's called Omega Treat toy or something like that. But it's an orange ball. It's about the size of a softball. It's got dimples, so it looks a little bit like a golf ball. And one of the dimples has a hole in it, and it's got a sleeve. So you can put her kibble in it, and keep on packing that sucker in. Make sure it shakes a little bit. Don't pack it in too much, it won't come out. She's got to nudge it just right to get the centrifugal force to get that kibble to come out, and two or three pieces of it will come out. Use that passive training, come up with a word for it. I use a word, different word for when I'm feeding my dog out of a bowl than if they're eating out of the ball. When they're eating out of the ball, I say soccer because it looks like a little soccer player. She's nudging this thing all around. So um, and you just say it the first time for about two or three months, and you say soccer, and she just nudges it around. Now, after she's fed, pick that thing up. She will open it up and find out why it's no longer paying out treats while it's empty. She doesn't know that. So your job is to pick it up after she gets done. This will help her earn her food, which boosts her self-esteem and confidence. It will slow down the feeding process. It'll burn some energy. Uh, it's calming. It's reassuring. There's about five or six positive things that happen. So um, now right now, she's quasi free fed she doesn't eat right away so i'd recommend the guardians go down put the food down but don't let her eat it use those escalating consequences i went after you and she's got to keep her appropriate distance then you take five chips of uh, five bites of something chip cracker peanuts m ms whatever you want um and when you get done eating then you invite her over tap the bowl or the ball whichever one it is now if it's a bowl come up with a different command word call it tacos or chimichanga or whatever you want to say so for four months, every time she takes her first bite of the bowl, you say that command word. I would probably have you switch it off and maybe feed her two or three times a day. Feed her with the ball for uh, maybe for dinner and feed her out of the bowl for breakfast. Because uh, the breakfast, I would pr recommend you probably get up. Now, right now she gets a cookie. And uh, I can't remember all the things that happen in the morning. But she gets a cookie just for getting a cookie. What I would do is if you want that cookie, the cookie you get for going outside. So I throw, so I show her that I have a cookie, walk over the door, tell her to sit, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. When she sits, open the door, throw the cookie out. When she comes and licks it up, come up with a command word that means to go outside. Call it Adventureland, uh, you know, what direction is that? Uh, that's south, right? The east? Yeah, yeah, call it uh, Council Tucky or whatever you wanna say. Uh, New York. Uh, but you come up with a word that means to go out the door. So that way when you open the door, you can say New York and that means to go out. She agrees. Um, so basically, uh, then she gets to go out and do her business, then she comes back inside, then the human's going to eat something first, uh, put the bowl down first, excuse me, then the human eats something, the dog's not allowed to get within seven feet, then we're going to go over and invite the, when we get done eating, invite the dog, <coughs> tap the bowl, we're going to talk about that in a sec, so tap the bowl, and she's going to, and when she comes over, she hasn't come over within, uh, like, let's say she's at whatever distance, and start tapping the bowl, if she moves, adds any distance between, then I immediately pick up the bowl and dump it. If she just stays there, I might tap for up to a minute, but don't over, over encourage. She's got to come and eat. It doesn't, she knows what the concept is. But if she doesn't come over within a minute, I pick up the bowl, I go dump it empty, I put the empty bowl. It's important to put the empty bowl back down. She does not eat again until the next meal. Now, whoever blinks first on this one loses. So don't compensate by giving her extra treats or chicken or whatever the case may be. She doesn't eat again until the next meal. My parent, if she goes longer than three days, let me know, but I'm guessing it'll probably be about a day maybe a day and a half before she actually eats. So you're saying the mess hall is not open all day long. You eat when I give you permission to eat, or if you don't want to eat, that's on you, it's not on me. I'm giving you the option to eat, you're choosing to turn it down. So don't feel bad about it. Okay, um, let me see, We uh, getting back to, come. That's passive training, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, getting back to rule, uh, well, exercise. Um, you can also, the gardens here are doing a good job of playing hide and seek. 
Uh, and they're actually doing a kind of advanced version of a scent game. And that's what I would recommend you do is go to Google and Google scent games, S-C-E-N-T. Using a nose is very physically draining of energy for a dog. So if we had treats or what, there's a whole bunch of different versions of games. The guards right now are hiding uh, a dummy somewhere in the house and she's got to use a nose to go find it. I mean, they do this with drug dogs and, and uh, dogs who smell cancer in people's bodies. It's very stimulating and rich and rewarding for them to do that. So those are some opportunities, some ways to exercise. And again, practice that fetch the way I described because that's a real powerful one because she can do it outside. She is cooped up and so it gives her outside. But just make sure you don't practice or do the exercise when there are dogs nearby or people on the trail. We don't want to give her practice at reacting to people or dogs or whatever it is. Okay, we also talked about uh, rules and the importance of rules. Most of my clients have no rules for their dog. Children go through life probing to determine what they can get. Dogs go through life probing waiting for somebody to say that's where the line is. Then they circle back around and test again and again. It, consistency is the name of the game when it comes to teaching a dog. So then I come in, I, I probe and you say no, and then I circle back around, and this time you aren't paying attention, I cross the threshold, I don't know what it is. So you have to block the dog or consistently disagree enough times before they're like, okay, I'm not gonna go on the carpet or wherever it is. Now I went through a whole litany of dog psychology and how dogs learn with the guardians. I'm not gonna go through it here, but it's important, the summation of it is that rewarding a dog by breaking a rule is a horrible way to reward the dog. There's a lot of ways to reward her. Pet her, talk to her, sing to her, take her for a walk, play fetch, throw the treats, belly rubs, all that fun stuff. Breaking a rule to reward her is really confusing and causes frustration. She already has a lot of frustration. So consistency is the name of the game. So um, I have like, a lot of clients where like, you know, everybody in the house is doing this and then they have one person in the house that doesn't do it. Really, really underrides everybody else. Or even the worst thing is like we have people who are doing it and then we have the holidays coming up, Thanksgiving's coming up. We have like a relative that comes in and just like, completely ignores. Well, anything a dog is doing when we pet them is what we're reinforcing. So if we come home, and that's actually something we should, I forgot to go over, um, when uh, dad came home, she got really excited at the door. And so when she, any, if you pet your dog when it's excited, you're gonna make it more excited. Nervous, you'll make it more nervous, anxious, more anxious, aggressive, more aggressive. If your dog is fearful and you wanna comfort it, you can lay your hand on them and they do associate the touch with affection, but as soon as you start petting it, you'll make them more excited. The guardians here have been inadvertently making their more and more excited. And just like any other creature on the planet, excited is not a good time to concentrate. Those don't go marry, go in hand in hand. So when you come home, I, and when you have guests come over, now the guests that she's reacted to, watch the video above and go over that. But for people that she knows and she likes, they should walk in the room, and especially for the humans that live here, walk in and don't even look at her. See her, but don't look at her directly. And she's gonna be all spazzing out, barking and all that. If we pet her, we're, in, we're rewarding that unbalanced energy. Instead of what we're gonna do is we're just gonna ignore her. Let's say that she's where the, she is the uh, Coke can in this video. Can you see in the, in the shot? Okay, so we're just gonna ignore her and do our business, come in, make our martini, kiss the wife, we want all this fun stuff. And then as soon as she calms down and we recognize that, we wanna start engaging with her because we wanna let her know that calm energy is something I'm very attractive. So I start reaching for it. As soon as I reach about this far, she's gonna start wiggling. I pull my arm back and continue doing what I'm doing. I'm not saying no, I'm not punishing the dog. This is operant conditioning. This is one of the two ways that dogs learn. When you're calm, you're very attractive to us. When you're excited, you become invisible. But it's important everybody does this. And when you're a guest, you have social pressure. You come in the house, well, the dog has to like me, and I'm gonna pet the dog to, let the dog, to make sure the dog likes me. Well, we're gonna amplify that behavior if we're petting an excited dog. So one of the best things a guest can do and the humans who live here, just ignore, and it'll take a lot of repetition, but eventually she'll learn, I'll just need to stay calm. And so that's why we also talked about petting with a purpose and passive training, but I'm going to talk about some rules real quick. We'll come back to that. So for uh, uh, other rules that we suggested, now being allowed in the furniture, which is pretty much a rule that she already has now, but there is one couch in the basement she likes to sit on, and it's right next to the stairs, which is the only real entrance into the basement. So I bet, think that's guard dog tower, number two. And so when she's there, she's on duty. She can't relax. So I recommend the Guardians get some X mats, the letter X, M-A-T-S. She actually likes to sit on the top of the couch up here as opposed to just down here. So sit at the same height as us said we're peers. Sitting up here, the dog thinks it has more authority than us. So uh, I would say that she's not allowed on the furniture for at least 90 days. And at that point, only with an invitation, but not for a patrol sort of thing. And it's not a reward for uh, good behavior. It's just I'm cold and I want Una next to me, so I invite her up.
So it's a one-time pass and only for good behavior. So she starts barking, she loses that privilege. Or you invite her up and she hangs out and then she goes down to get a drink of water and she comes back, she would need another invite. It's my couch, my chair. I'm just being benevolent enough to share it with the dog. The dog needs to adjust its leader-follower dynamic. And the more access she has to things, the more she thinks she's a full-fledged member of the tribe. And she's a member of the tribe, but she doesn't have the same right and privileges as the humans because she doesn't act the way that we want her to act yet. Once that behavior is in line, then we can kind of wax on the rules and give her more freedom just the way we do with little kids. So, um, all right. So other rules um, shouldn't be allowed within, eight, within seven feet of anybody who's eating. No more people food, especially not from the table. If you do want to you know, have some eating some steak, you want to give her some steak, chop it up a little bits, put it in the microwave, wait until the next day or the next meal so it doesn't smell like all the food you just got done eating. Um, and before you feed her each time, make sure you're eating something first. Uh, let me see. Then uh, other rules shouldn't be allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food. I would say not allowed in the hardwood when we're preparing food unless she's maybe over here. She could be on you know, where the carpet is for the dining room. She could be this part of the hardwood floor, but not that part. Or you might make just across the board. She's not across there. But I think that would be a little bit too strict. Uh, the other thing is when we're eating at the dinner table, she can't come from the work island. Uh, so really, the, the wood around the table all the way to the work island, all the way to the carpet. So we're not going to tell her specifically to go to the dog mat. She just got, can't come and break this rule. And this is a great way for her to practice. Now, one of the things that I recommend my guardians do is create scenarios or situations where you can help the dog practice. So when we're cooking, we're distracted. Remember, dogs go through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog. So if I'm stirring something and my back is the dog and it crosses the threshold and I stir for another 10 seconds and I turn around and tell the dog to get out, the dog's like, why? I've been here for 10 seconds. They don't understand why. So what I recommend you do, and she's probably already got this somewhat established, but if you're still establishing this, go in your kitchen. As soon as you cross the threshold, turn, and then walk backwards away from the dog. Take two steps backwards and pause. If the dog comes forward, your way of saying no is rushing back towards the dog. Don't ever pass the line, but rush towards the line. As soon as the dog vacates you, you stop. Wait for the dog to stop moving. Take one step backwards. Left foot, right foot, stop. If she comes across the line or approaches it, we rush towards her again. And you're going to do this back and forth again a number of times until eventually you take a step back and she stays in put. And you take another step back and another step back. Once you get to this point, then I want you to do your meal prep. And so I would really like you to do, like microwave a piece of roast beef or bacon while you're keeping your hips pointed towards the dog, and then pull it out, put it on your workout, then start grabbing the ingredients you're gonna to need to cook, the pots and pans, turn the oven on, a stove. It sure smells like you're cooking. You're in the place you normally are when you're cooking. But as soon as I cross the line, you're on me like white on rice. It doesn't even look like you're paying attention. We're doing a warm-up practice. We're prepping for the meal, which we gotta do anyways, but we're using that to our advantage, and we're watching the dog out of the corner of our eye. So as soon as she crosses the threat, if she's approaching, we hiss, she crosses it, we rush towards her. Eventually she'll sit or lie down outside the boundary. Then we put the bacon away and start her actual cooking. She doesn't see the difference. Do the same thing with the dinner table. <coughs> that was me. Uh, at the dinner table, uh, set the dinner plates where you normally do. Microwave piece of roast beef, sit down and cross the threshold or, uh, and cut it up and, and give it to people. And as soon as she approaches the threshold, you would hiss. And if she crosses it, we stand up and march towards her. So once she lays down there, then we feed, feed our actual meal. And our meal. And so the dog's warmed up, it knows what to do. This is really old, something that only should have to do for a week or two, and then she kind of knows when there's food to stay away, especially if we stop giving her people food. Now she's chewing a, a nylon, uh, she's actually chewing a rawhide, which I'm not a fan of because they're soaked in formaldehyde, bleach, and ammonia. And because dogs ingest them, they're not really healthy for them. You can let her have this one and chew it up. I just wouldn't buy her anymore. Get bully sticks. Use that card that I gave you to the green spot. Uh, you can also go to Long Dog Fat Cat, Pet uh, uh, Earth, uh, Pets Earth. Uh, three Dog Bakery. There's some good, other good places in town. I like the Green Spot because they are animal nutrition experts and she's fed the same food all the time. I think if you go, find a different line of food where you can change flavors, the same brand, but you change flavors each bag, that variety will keep, make her a little bit more enticed with it. And make sure you just tell them what, you know, she's gassy with this. That can help you find out what it is she's gassy about. Remember that coupon will get you five bucks off. I would also go in there and buy her Bully sticks, kneecaps. I bet you she likes the kneecaps. Kneecaps, almost all the dogs love. I love them because they really, the bully stick, they'll sit down and chew the whole thing. Kneecap, they'll chew on for a while. They'll get the easy bits, they'll leave it, and they'll come back and chew it another time and another time. You usually get about three to five chews on the kneecap. Bully stick usually go through the whole thing. So, um, and that would be also be something, once she settles down, that'd be a great, uh, for the guest, the video above, that'd be a great thing for the guest to give her the kneecap.
the whole time I get these kneecaps. Well, she, I wouldn't say that for her because she really needs to chew to or works out some frustration and burn some energy. But we're getting more exercise. Eventually, that is also another positive thing. When these guys come over, I get a kneecap. Maybe the kneecaps are exclusively for when the guys come over to play cart. Uh, there's a game that we play. Uh, so this way, the dog kind of has another positive attribute to it. So uh, coming up with a different food can really be beneficial for her uh, in terms of just uh, interest and all that fun stuff. Okay, so um, let me see. Other rules, another rule is for the door. So we go to the door, we say sit one time. The more you say it, the less you mean it. Say, and don't ask, oh, can you sit? She's like, no, I cannot. So sit. If she sits within three seconds, as soon as she sits, I fly the door open and she gets to go out. That's the reward. If she doesn't sit within three seconds, the first time I say it, I sit down in the immediate area and I wait for one minute. Ask your A friend, uh, the electronic girl, uh, to give you a one minute timer. And after one minute, go back to the door, command again the dog to SIT. If it doesn't SIT this time within three seconds, I walk away and sit down for two minutes. Next time I sit down for four minutes, eight minutes, 16 minutes, I keep double the length of time. I don't wanna go outside, you do. You wanna go outside, you gotta do something for me. You have to sit. It's another way to create a healthy leader follower dynamic. After a while, the dog will go sit at the door as her way of saying, I would like to go outside, please. Most of us train our dogs to jump at the door because jumping at the door gets us to let them in. So eventually do it with one direction, uh, whichever dog, direction the dog's more motivated. If the dog really wants to be outside, start with her inside. But eventually when she starts, uh, when she's, you can do it both directions. Now you hear her breathing really heavy. That can be a sign of stress. It can also be a sign that she's worked up. So when she's breathing heavy like that, I would prefer that you try not to pet her unless you know for a fact that she's only doing that way because she, she was breathing heavy. Now, she's over by the door, so I'm waiting a little bit, but every once in a while, I want you to do some desensitization. You heard her knock, uh, when a couple of those knocks, she barked. So I'm gonna use that intentionally here once she turns her back to me and she's not paying attention. Now, she didn't know what it was. So she's checking you with her humans. So she's not paying attention, so I'll, and then only do this when she's not paying attention and never do it with anybody's outside or about to come in. That's the worst time. We wanna create an association decided to come in the shop for that one. But the idea is we're not getting up and we're not validating it because nobody comes inside. And after a while, she's interested, but she's not barking. So it's kind of a similar principle to what I talked about with the doorbell, except for the doorbell, I guess I talked about creating a command word for that. This one is just, and we get a and no barks. So the, uh, we want to, again, get her off of being the guard dog. Um, okay, so that's desensitization. We also went over, um, let me see, uh, uh, other rules. I think that's it for the rules. Um, but look for other ways to delay gratification and ask her to do things. Before you put the food down, before you even start the process of feeding her, sit. And then reach for the bag. She gets up, stop. Now, one of the things I'd like the guardians to do is when they reach to pet her, make sure you pet her under the chin like I talked about. But when she sits, to, uh, tell her to sit and then start petting her. As soon as she gets out of the sit, stop. Tell her to sit again. When she sits, pat her on the chin and say sit. After like you tell her two or three times, when she gets up, stop. When she gets up, and then just wait for the sit on her own. We want her to start figuring these out, things out on her own. After a while, she will. And as soon as she sits, make sure you reach over and start petting her. That's more of the petting with the purpose of past training. We'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, but look, at your game, your rules. You want, to, you want me to feed you? You gotta sit. You wanna be able to put the collar, the leash attached? You gotta sit. Let me open the car door? You gotta sit. Um, when we're on a walk, I make the dog sit before we cross any street. And I have a dog now that used to run in the street, now she stops at any, if she's chasing a ball, she stops at the edge of the street. It takes practice. Um, okay, we also talked about petting with a purpose and passive training. Petting with a purpose is if you, the dog is telling you what to do or you want to pet the dog. So there's intention with this one. So basically the dog comes up and nudges us or jumps up on us, we pet it, we're telling the dog, yeah, you're the boss of me, you can tell me what to do. Well, what we want to do instead is when the dog comes up and nudges us, we give the dog a counter order, tell her to sit. If she's already sitting here, ask her to sit over here or ask her to lay down. Better yet, tell her to lay down. Now, if she does it within three seconds and you pet her under her chin and say sit again or down or whatever the word is, and then pet her as much or as little as you want. But if you tell her to sit and she doesn't sit, ignore her. Playing hard to get works great for dating. It works great for dogs too. Show her, I, you're, I, you're number one on my list. But I have, 19, I have 19 other things I can do, and it's not going to bother me at all not to be pet you. I wanted to pet you, but you weren't interested. So think of petting your dog as paying your dog for a specific job. 
The job is to sit at the door, or sit here or whatever it is. So you're telling the dog to do something. After a while, the dog will realize, I can no longer tell you what to do, I have to ask. And better than ask, I have to pay for the privilege of your attention. The dog will start paying you by prepaying by a sit to ask for attention. And what it does, make sure you reach over and pet a bone on the chin, otherwise she'll go back to nudging and jumping or barking or whatever it is. Now, remember to use the watchword paycheck or another word if you want to use something else. Paycheck just means that someone suspects I, for, I have forgotten and petting without a purpose. So someone comes to the room and I'm petting the dog and she's standing up, they say paycheck. Even if I did it right, I stop, I tell her to sit, if she sits, I pet her on the chin, say sit, and I say, actually, I asked her to sit, when you open the door, she stood up and I continue petting her, but thank you, because I do forget to pet without a purpose. It's not a gotcha, so we don't argue about it, we immediately comply, it just gives us another opportunity to practice again. And even if you want to pet the dog, you should still tell the dog to sit, and if it doesn't, show the dog, mm -mm. either you do it my way or the highway. And there's no attention. We're not punishing the dog. We're creating, a, I call the two window scenario. Window one is I get what I want for doing what the human wants. Window two is nothing happens. Well, shoot, I like what I want better than nothing happening. That's all the motivation I need. I don't need to be punished, which is how unfortunately a lot of dog trainers in Omaha still work. So if you do this right and you're consistent about it, the dog starts offering you the behaviors that you want and it prepays with a sit or an LAY. I would not recommend the shake if she knows how to shake because dogs are like, if you like this, you must really like this. And when a dog jumps up on us, that can be a way of claiming us as their property. Another way of confusing the dog. So um, that's petting with a purpose. So if you want to pet the dog or the dog is telling you to do it, you're not, you're not validating it. You're giving the dog a counter order. Um, or pre unless they're prepaying. And prepaying is more in line with something I call passive training. Passive training is just being observant, not influencing the dog in any way, shape, or form. Just paying them for the job they did that you didn't ask them for. So I use a watch for this as celebrate, because we're celebrating the th things that we want the dog to do. So if the dog walks up to me, I'm watching TV, I'm looking this direction, the dog comes and sits here, and somebody says, celebrate to me, I look over the, well, if it, let's say it comes over and it's standing here. Someone says, celebrate, I look at the dog, I narrate whatever the dog is doing. If it's standing, since we haven't taught it a stand command, I'm gonna assume that means it just came to me and I missed the opportunity to pet it. Then we only have three seconds. So if someone says celebrate to me, you don't have time to ask them. You just turn and pet the dog and say whatever they're doing. If they're standing, pet them and say come. If they're sitting, pet them and say sit, uh, laying down, crash, or whatever the word is you want to use. And again, try to pet under the chin. You can pet anywhere you want, just never reach over the head, because uh, pat on top of the head, because that creates that down nose orientation. And she already has some insecurity issues. Now we went over the escalating consequences. I'm not going to go over those in the video. If you forget what those are, please message me. This is one of the little tricks that you actually have to pay me for. Now she's over there grumbling at the, at the door. Remember, if she ever growls or she bares her teeth, that is not aggression. That is the antithesis of aggression. She's saying, I disagree. We don't ever want to say no or chastise the dog. We want to immediately increase the distance between the dog and whatever it is and probably take a mental note of what that situation was. So maybe we can call David and I can come back and I can show you how we can make that a positive experience so that it doesn't feel like it needs to growl. But I've had a lot of people that, uh, as clients, that cheat or that punish or correct or disagree with the dog for growling. The dog's like, that's fine. I'll just go straight to a bite. We like the growl, we like the warning. Um, okay. So she, she, she did all that, but she didn't get, I can't see her, she, but she didn't get up right away. Now she is a little bit uh, like myself, probably a little bit more insulated than she should be. And so I recommend the guardians get, uh, start feeding her some fresh green beans. Get about, I would say probably about eight or 10 per meal, chop them up into little bits, they're about the size of their kibble, and then, uh, and then sub, take about 10% of the kibble out of the bowl and put those beans in. The fiber will help her feel full. I would also recommend feeding her carrots. I know she doesn't like carrots, so what you can do is take a potato peeler, peel like three slices of it off, and then just dice it up into tiny little bits and sprinkle them in her food. After she eats them enough, she might develop a taste for them. The other thing you can do is you be eating the food, and this is one of the few times I actually would... And if dog sees it would go in my mouth and it comes straight in their mouth, they're usually going to eat it because it's like where the taste test would form. So that's, and it wards off two types of cancers in dogs, uh, broccoli and carrots. So those are good things to feed your dog. Um, I talked about the treat dispensing toys. Um, if you forget what those are, let me know. Something else you might want to get for her is a water buffalo horn. It will probably outlast your dog. Water buffalo, you can get them at Pets Earth in nice places. It's, make sure it's solid or just that the, the lining of it is a, really thin. It kind of like, like a horn, it is a horn, but it'll be really thick on the sides. It'll smell nasty for about a week or two and then it won't smell anymore. 
So let her have it, go at it. But you want her to have a, a variety of good things that, for her to chew on. Remember, when it comes to Kong, black is stronger than red. Uh, yes. And, uh, but I would definitely get yourself a, a plethora of kneecaps and some of the stuff from the green spot so that when you have people come over as guests, you have something really high value to give to her that the guest gets to give to her. But try to get the guest to get her to sit a couple times before you give her treats, as they're giving her treats and stuff, just give her used to listening to guests. And if you see her, she goes over and she grabs them and starts chewing on it, that might be an indication that she's stressed. That's probably a good idea to go over and get her some exercise. Um, let me see. We would also want to a focus exercise. Now, if you forget how to do that, go to doggoneproblems.com, click on dog training tips, and on the right side of the, of the page or the bottom of the page, there's a search box. Type in focus. I have shown hundreds of people how to do it. I'll explain how to do it. Remember, it's one second, one second. Don't flip your wrist. So, boom. So, I'm kind of twisting it at just a tiny bit to get to my nose, go in her mouth, and say the word focus after it goes in her mouth. Remember to get within 15 seconds. A, a focus in the house in different parts of the house within seven days maximum. Next stage is to practice outside. Then eventually you practice on walks when nobody's around. And then at that point you start using it. She's, you're on a walk and she sees somebody, a jogger's approaching. You say focus, she looks up at you and you walk down somebody's driveway. You increase the distance for her so she doesn't have to. Uh, she doesn't have to react or anything else. Now one last little thing I'm gonna go over is about uh, personal space and boundaries. Let's say that this represents the dog. If I want to pet her, a lot of people, we reach over the top of the head, like I said, which we prefer to reach underneath. But we also should ask the dog if it wants to be petted. We assume that it's okay to pet a dog, but I might assume that a girl would like to get a, a neck massage. That doesn't mean it's right for me to go give her a neck massage. I need to ask her. With dogs, we think what I'm doing is a positive, so it's okay to pet you. Well, if she's fearful, we can amplify that. She's probably going to be more reactive. But what you're going to find is after she gets a little bit more comfortable with people coming over, and I want you to practice that. So try to arrange to have the guys that come over for the game come over independent of that game. Because when they're here, they're here for several hours. That can be unnerving. So they come over, and you just practice this. You don't have to worry about being a host. Then they leave. They plan a half an hour trip. Some people will be able to do it. Some people won't. But you need to build in the practice time. Training a dog in the moment is the worst time to do it because you're distracted. So try to do it when you can ha arrange and pick your shots where you can give the dog your full attention. Exercise the dog first and definitely exercise before the guys come over to the game. All right, so this is the dog's nose and I think that I'm okay. I'm to the point where I could pet the dog. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reach and I'm gonna stop here. And notice I'm using this part of my hand, not this part of my hand. For another animal, if they're getting attacked, this is what they're gonna see, that paw coming down. So I hold it like this and I stop about two or three inches in front of the dog's nose. Now if the dog bears its teeth, it's a way of saying no. So we would just kind of pull our arm back. We're not gonna correct it. But typically what a dog will do if it doesn't want to uh, you to pet them is they're gonna turn their head to the side or they're gonna back up or they're lower their head. So if I reach over to pet the dog and I stop here and the dog turns his head to the side and I pull my arm back and don't continue, I was like, oh, that guy listened to me. Because a lot of dogs become aggressive because everybody comes over and pets me. I don't want to be petted. I don't want to oh, fine, pet me. Whatever. I don't like it. I don't like it. And then one day the dog's having a crappy day. And somebody reaches over and pet the dog and goes, Dah! and the dog and the person backs up. And the dog's like, that's what I wanted. So that's how I get you to move away. I snap at you and then you move away. Oh, cool. I'll start snapping at everybody. Might be what happened here. It happens for a lot of dogs. So the more that your dog recognizes that people are listening and showing me respect, there's a whole sociological discussion I go over this with my clients because my clients who are female are touched a lot. Men, we don't touch each other the way that we touch women. And it's inappropriate to do so unless you ask the woman or you have a relationship with the woman. So the more the dog, if, if a woman comes in the room and knows that I'm always going to go rub her shoulder, she comes in the room and she like positions herself in a position where I can't have access. She's not freaking out about it, but she has to factor that in, which she shouldn't. Well, for the dog, we dogs sometimes do that by keeping distance. Well, the more the dog sees that that person is listening to me. I reached out and the dog turned its head away, and I, the human moved to pull his hand back. I can trust this human. It's listening to me. That makes me more inclined to want to go over and let the dog, the human pet me. So after a couple of times, the dog might come over and sit. And again, you reach this time, and this time the dog touches you with the nose. Then you can start reaching over, tickle under its chin, or whatever you feel comfortable with doing. Um, anything else you want me to go over? I don't think so. Uh, it's like I've done this before. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, all right. So now here's the thing. You're going to have questions. You're going to have setbacks. There are going to be ebbs and flows. Go with it. Don't just, oh, it stopped working. It's just the dog remembering it's going to try to go back the way it was. She thinks everything's fine the way it is. It's not. It's shortening her life. It's stressful for her. It's stressful for you guys. So stay the course. Now, if you have, the only time I get mad with my clients is when they have a question or a problem. They don't call or message me. 
I can only help you if you let me know. I don't charge for phone calls or texts. Text is the best way to reach me because I get about 50 email, uh, phone calls a day and a lot of them telemarketers nowadays. So if you leave me a voicemail, I not look at it for a day or two, especially when I'm in California. But when I get a text message, I can see that truncated part of it. So text me a picture of it. Hey, I had a quick question about Una, and then I can get back to you with a quick answer. I can share videos from other clients and things like that. And it's very normal we need to make little phone calls and adjustments over the first week or two after the session. Now, I would like you to uh, contact Becca if you want to work on that loose leash walking, which I think would be really helpful because uh, it's just we can't have her pulling you down the street. And just being able to have a dog when it gets the end of the leash automatically come back to you without you having to do it is pretty awesome. It costs you about four hours worth of your time but you have a lifetime of, of really enjoyable walks. And it does work for dogs that are lunging at things because it gives you a nice way to get the dog out of that without having to worry about um, the, uh, snapping the leash or pulling you down the street. So please let me know if you have any questions or problems. All right, uh, this is about where I'm gonna sign off. So let me get a little, uh, little Una here first. Sit, sit. One last thing, remember you to say it like that twice. So I give the dog a command, sit, sit. During the command stage, I tell the dog what to do. Then when I pay it, I qualify and let it know what I'm paying it for. And if she ever doesn't come to you, you can hold your hand up like this. Come. Yes. Well, this is Una, and this is Una's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, or sometimes you do it.